Okay, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Tom Schmelk. I'm one of the forest entomologists for the Maine Forest Service, and I'm going to be giving you a um, background on brown tail moth. So, the people that will be calling uh, 2 on 1 to ask for information um, will almost always be homeowners occasionally. Um, we do have town managers that call us, but it's 99% um, going to be homeowners or um, people from out of state that might be coming um, in to, to basically um, ask what the risk is for, um, for their families when they're coming into camp or to vacation. Um, so they'll be getting the, the contact information for two on one. Um, we're going to be advertising that through our um, brown tail moth brochures as well as on the website. Um, so they'll, that's how they'll be finding you um, at two on one. Uh, so areas in the state that it's usually the worst uh, is along the coast um, where there's abundant host trees such as oak and apple and cherry um, and around people's houses and camps. So um, that's usually why we're going to be getting homeowners. It's not necessarily going to be people um, hiking through the woods that are going to be contacting um, 211. It's, it's going to be homeowners that have uh, brown tail moth usually around their house. Um, or their rental um, rental camp. So these are the four most common frequently asked questions um, that we get from callers. Um, usually the number one most common frequently asked question is what do I do about um, the webs high up in the trees around their house? Um, basically they're just asking what the options are um, and we've outlined all the answers to each of these four questions and many others in those frequent, that frequently asked questions document. Um, they also ask uh, another common question is what is the best pesticide to use for brown tail moth? Um, what are my options if I can't afford to treat all of my trees? Um, and just general questions about the life cycle and, and biology of brown tail moth. Uh, so I guess we'll get into what brown tail moth is. Um, I'll give you guys a little background of, on the biology, um, its life cycle, and basically what's going on in Maine currently. So brown tail moth is an invasive moth originally from Europe. Um, it was introduced to the United States in 1897 on some live plant material, um, and it's been established in Maine since 1904. So it's not a very picky eater. It has a very wide range of hosts. Um, the most common um, tree species that we find it in are oak, birch, apple, pear, um, crab apple, and, and various other hardwoods such as poplar um, and elm trees. So the callers are obviously not going to um, be able to see this graphic, but um, the takeaway home message from this graph is that brown tail moth um, it's going to have those two orange spots towards the tail end there. Um, and brown tail moth is obviously the caterpillar that is um, to, the mo to the left of this graph here. So a little bit about brown tail moth history. Um, like I said, brown tail moth has been in Maine since 1904. Um, it's definitely not a new problem by any means. We just happen to be in the middle of an outbreak. Um, that photo in the top left is a child standing next to a um, pile of winter webs. Um, each one of those winter webs is a little bit smaller than the palm of your hand, um, but we'll get into that in the life cycle in a little bit. So at the turn of the century, extensive control efforts were made. Uh, in the early 1900s, uh, people clipped winter webs by the tens of thousands as evidenced by those uh, previous two photos. Um, spray projects were initiated, uh, federal quarantine was imposed. Um, so if you can make it out on the map, the furthest line out is 1914, and that was basically about um, the extent of the spread of brown tail moth. So as you can see, it was 
um, you know, half of Vermont, two thirds of Massachusetts, half of Connecticut, um, into New York, Rhode Island, two thirds of Maine. Um, and then there was population, uh, a population collapse in the late teens, early twenties, um, and Maine and a little bit in Cape Cod, uh, in Massachusetts. Um, and there's been outbreaks and population decreases, um, for the past hundred years, this is just happens to be one of the outbreaks. Uh, so, the major problem with brown toe moth in Maine is that it's a human health risk. So, um, people, the caterpillars are covered in toxic hairs um, that give people um, a rash similar to poison ivy, um, and this is the the major reason why this is. Um, this moth is a concern in Maine. It's not necessarily a huge forest pest. Uh, it's more of a uh, human health risk and nuisance. Uh, so those toxic hairs that I was talking about, um, they're very tiny, um, 0 .5, 0 0.15 millimeters. Um, they are barbed and hollow and they contain a toxin, which, so in addition to the mechanical irritation that these people are, are getting in their skin from the barbs on the hair, um, they're also getting um, that toxin in them. So uh, the toxin can be, um, or the hairs can be carried in the air and settle on grass and leaves and yards under boats, um, etc. So it's a contact with brown toe moth when they're out doing yard work, breaking leaves, mowing the lawn, stuff like that. Um, the hairs can become airborne again. So if there's a large pile of leaves under somebody's boat trailer or under their deck and they disturb those hairs, um, the hairs can become airborne. Um, and the toxin is very stable in the environment and can last between one to three years. Um, so it's, it's sort of an ongoing risk. Um, oftentimes um, when people are raking leaves, they're um, making these hairs airborne and they breathe them in and they do cause some respiratory issues in, in addition to um, a rash on, on the outside of your body. So the, la the rash can last um, between hours and weeks and uh, people vary in their severity. Some people don't react at all and some people react very severely. As you can see from that photo, um, each one of those bumps is where a toxic hair um, got into the skin and injected some of that toxin. Uh, so the rash is most common in late June and July. That's when the caterpillars are largest. Um, the rash can develop immediately or after a few hours. Um, and a lot of the treatment is focused on just relieving the symptoms. Uh, so a secondary problem uh, with brown tail moth is that they are um, a pest on, on forest trees, although not nearly as bad as some other um, defoliating insects. Um, and caterpillar feeding can kill the tree um, if they've been defoliated for three or four years in a row. So what's happening in a lot of Maine is that we've had a drought for the past two years, which has probably helped increase the population of brown tail moth, um, but it's also hurt the trees that they feed on. So they're getting defoliated by caterpillars, um, but then also having to deal with this drought. Okay, now we'll get into the life cycle of brown tail moth. Um, and we'll, we'll start in the winter um, at what stage they are in the winter. So in the winter, they are um, hibernating in, in these winter webs, these hibernacula, um, and it's basically composed of leaves that are wrapped with silk um, to make this nest. And the caterpillars work communally to um, create, create each of these nests. So between each one of these um, size nests has between 25 and 400 caterpillars per web. Oftentimes they are in the tippy tops of these mature oak trees, uh, so 60 to 100 feet up, so well out of reach, but um, they also are in apple trees and cherry trees and, and lower vegetation. Uh, so I'll get into management later, but we do recommend that if it's between 
um, September and mid April that you do that we we recommend that if they are able to clip out the webs that they do clip out the webs because again there's 25 to 400 caterpillars between or inside each one of these webs. Okay, so fast forward to mid-April um, when it starts getting warm out, high 40s, low 50s, um, the caterpillars will start to emerge um, from those winter webs and they begin to feed. Um, so the photo on the right is a, um, you can see just above the thumb there, there's a, a small brown-tailed moth caterpillar. Um, and what happened is that the caterpillars mine out the buds if the leaves aren't um, exposed and, um, and the, the buds haven't burst. So they can cause damage like that, but then when the leaves start to unfurl, um, they will feed on the leaves communally. Um, so they emerge from the winter webs in mid-April um, and they feed on the foliage until late June, early July. Um, they'll molt between five to eight times um, and when so basically when any insect um, is growing and, and needs to get larger, they'll shed their skin um, to, to grow larger. So they'll molt or shed their skin five to eight times. So each one of those shed skins also has toxic hairs on them. The caterpillars will shed uh, the toxic hairs with their old skin. Um, and these toxic skins will be on the ground around the, the trees that they're in, or they will be um, attached um, in some way to these host trees. Um, so after the caterpillars stop feeding in late June, early July, um, they're going to start moving around looking for a good place to spin a cocoon and, and pupate to turn into a moth. Um, and often they'll make these cocoons in the leaves um, or branches of the tree that they grew up on. Um, but often they will um, spin this cocoon on the side of people's houses under their eaves. Uh, any any sheltered place really. Um, so these cocoons are also full of toxic hairs. So when the caterpillar is fully grown and it sh it starts making this cocoon, it sheds its its last larval skin and incorporate some of these toxic hairs into the cocoon in order to protect itself at the most vulnerable life stage. Um, so just as a, um, as a summary, so the caterpillars um, have the toxic hairs, the shed skins have toxic hairs, and also the cocoons that they spend um, have toxic hairs. So um, the adult moths are gonna emerge from those cocoons sometime in July. Um, and they're gonna mate and lay eggs. So that photo um, on this slide is an adult brown tail moth. This is a male. And you can see why they're called brown tail moth. The abdomen is covered with those brown hairs. So the adult moths do not have toxic hairs. So those brown hairs on the abdomen are not those toxic hairs that um, or on the caterpillars that, that cause people problems. So one question that you might get um, is also people asking if they, you know, kill all the moths by their light, are they doing any good? Um, and unfortunately, most of the moths that are coming to these lights are males. And unfortunately for us guys, males do not really matter too much biologically um, in the grand scheme of things. So um, the male, mostly the males are attracted to, to lights around people's houses and the peak activities between 10 p.m. and midnight. Um, again, heavily weighted to males. It's something like a ratio of uh, 15 to 1, so 15 males for every one female. Um, so after the adult moths mate um, in, in July, the females will lay eggs on the leaves of host trees. So again, oak, apple, cherry, crab apple, elm, poplar, birch, um, stuff like that. So that photo shows an egg mass. Um, there's between 200 and 400 eggs in that egg mass and she'll, the female will cover the egg mass with um, the hairs from her abdomen. Again, not the toxic hairs, um, just another layer of protection. 
in that photo, you can also see very small caterpillars climbing away from the egg mass. Uh, and they're, so this photo was taken in August when the eggs are hatching, um, cat, very small caterpillars are coming out. Um, so at, when the caterpillars hatch from that egg mass, they're going to uh, come out and they're going to feed communally and they're not really defoliating the leaves. They're basically just eating the outer layer of the leaves. So we call that skeletonizing. Um, so the caterpillars will feed communally with all their brothers and sisters and they will um, work together to basically spin that cocoon um, or that, that winter web that they're going to spend the winter in. Um, and they'll be doing this in, in August and September. And as you can see from that picture on the bottom, uh, again, the, this winter web is composed of silk um, on the tips of the branches. And it's gonna be also composed of leaves that are uh, silked together. And this is the stage that they're gonna, um, they're all gonna be in that nest during the winter and, and hibernate until mid-April when they, they emerge again. So this is a summarized life cycle. Um, the takeaway and home message from this is that the highest risk exposure risk for hares is basically between, um, uh, basically from mid-April um, all the way through mid-July. Um, but also do remember that there are cast skins, shed skins, and um, pupil cocoons, all which have those toxic hairs, and those toxic hairs do um, remain viable in the environment uh, for one to three years. This is a, also a good graph to save, um, just to be able to quickly reference um, the activity period uh, for this moth throughout the year. Uh, so the current situation in Maine is that um, brown tail moth populations have continued to increase since 2015. Um, that's probably due uh, somewhat to the droughts that we've been having. Um, hot dry weather is good for this caterpillar. Um, it's been found in uh, 12 out of Maine's 16 counties, although that's not to say that 12, those 12 counties have established populations. We um, have just picked up a random moth or two in, in some of those counties. Um, we do aerial surveys during the fall and spring um, each year. And last year in 2018, we mapped 126,000 acres of, um, of damage, which is up quite a bit from previous decades. Uh, so this is the risk map for 2019. Um, this is also available um, on the web. So if you type in uh, brown tail moth risk map, um, this is the first link that comes up. It's a PDF um, if you need to reference it again. Um, so ways to control brown tail moth. Um, so when you're traveling in May and July to infested areas, don't park underneath trees that could serve as a host. Um, so don't park in, under any apples or cherries or oaks. Um, new infestations are anecdotally linked to locations that have a very high population of brown tail moth. Um, and you're gonna wanna make sure that you're not moving any larva, so any, no caterpillars um, and, and also cocoons and adult moths. Um, again, this, this slide just uh, reiterates some of the ways that brown tail moth spreads. Um, it's, it's the wandering larva in, in late May and late, uh, late May and June. Um, and it's the, when they're trying to shelter place to pupate and sometimes it's wheel wells of your boat um, and stuff like that. So uh, precautions and personal uh, protection. So June through August, um, in areas of high infestation, you're going to obviously want to avoid exposure to hares um, and avoid places that are heavily infested by caterpillars. Um, one important note that people often forget is that you're going to want to dry your laundry inside um, to avoid having those airborne hares um, getting into your bed sheets and, and clothing. Um, we ask that people that are in highly infested areas year round that they use caution cleaning up um, debris left by caterpillars. So shed skins and, and 
pupil cocoons. Um, again, that toxin is very stable in the environment and can remain viable for uh, a number of years. Um, so when people are gardening or doing um, or for the season, um, we ask that they use um, personal protection equi equipment. Um, and I believe I go into that to the next slide. Okay, so some of the some of the PPE that people can use: uh, coveralls that are closed tightly at the neck, wrists, and ankles; uh, respirator and goggles to prevent the hairs from getting into your lungs, your eye; head covering and gloves. Um, we've note we noticed that um, pre-contact wipes um, with pre uh, oof, pre pre-contact poison ivy wipes um, help decrease um, the amount of hairs that stick into you because they close your pores. Um, but al also a lot of the pharmacies along the coast, um, they have remedies for if you do get brown toe moth. Often um, these remedies contain witch hazel or Benadryl um, or a combination. Um, if people are working outdoors in infested areas, uh, they're either going to want to work on a wet day, um, mow their lawn um, when there's dew on the lawn or, or if it rained the previous day um, at, or just wet down the area with a garden hose um, if you're gonna be raking leaves. Um, it's always a good idea. And if uh, people are vacuuming caterpillars or, or cocoons or shed skins off the side of their house, um, they're gonna wanna use a vacuum that has a HEPA filter. Um, otherwise, they're just gonna be blowing those hairs out and breathing them in again. Um, so just a few notes on brown tail moth. These also might uh, become questions. So cold winter temperatures, temperatures do not kill brown tail moth. So it's coming from an area in Europe that is um, basically at the same latitude that we are. Uh, experiences our coldest winters and our hottest summers, so they're already pre-adapted. Um, cool wet springs, uh, sort of like the one that we've been having so far, um, do help decrease the population. Um, there is a fungus that attacks brown toe moth as well as a virus. Um, and these two pathogens uh, really proliferate um, in these cool wet conditions. Um, the caterpillars tend to huddle together um, and spread these diseases. Um, and also the fungal spores and the viral spores can um, better survive when it's damp and cold. Um, so the crucial time for cool wet spring is basically um, May through June. Um, so this cool wet weather that we've been having this year is certainly beneficial, but we sort of needed to keep, need it to keep going into June for it to be very effective. Okay, so um, brown, clipping brown tail moth uh, winter webs. So this is going going to be basically uh, for the time period of October to mid uh, mid April. Um, clipping them outside that window is sort of a lost cause since the caterpillars are aren't in those nests. Um, this is the most recommended way of dealing with brown tail moth if you can if you are able to reach the winter webs. So if you prune the winter webs. Um, Two ways you can destroy them are to burn them uh, or to soak them in uh, soapy water for a few days. And that soapy water helps break down the, uh, the water repellentness of uh, these winter webs. Um, we also recommend that um, when you're, we also recommend clipping webs since the risk of contact with the uh, irritating hairs is extremely low. Um, and we recommend that if people are clipping out the webs during the winter, that they actually destroy the webs and, and not just leave them on the ground because the caterpillars can, um, can climb right back up into the trees. Um, and we recommend that you clip uh, the winter webs before mid-April. After mid-April, the caterpillars will be out and about. Uh, so a little bit about chemical control larva. Um, so chemical control um, in the spring before the end of May um, is beneficial. You're trying to catch these caterpillars when they're still very small um, and knock them down when they're um, small and don't have as many.
when you're doing chemical control, you're going to want to hire a licensed pesticide applicator. Um, so there's a list of arborists and licensed pesticide applicators on the main Forest Service website. Um, some of those uh, frequently asked questions deal with this, and um, we have the link to our website um, at the bottom of those questions. Um, this is just the, these are the three most common biological pesticides that are used, um, spinosad, BT, and azadorectin. Um, these are just uh, some definitions. So the reason why they're called biological pesticides it, or biorational pesticides is that they are derived from um, a more natural means. It's not necessarily synthetic chemicals. Um, so these are the three that um, a lot of people, uh, a lot of pesticide applicators in Maine use um, because there's all, they're also trying to, you know, protect the marine fisheries and lobster fisheries. So um, some of these have limited use, um, but some of these are very useful. Um, this is just a pros and cons um, chart of a few different methods, including chemical spray, BT spray, injections, and pruning. Um, I'll let you read through this at your leisure, um, but it just outlines um, some of the pros and cons of, of each method. Um, and that's all I got. Um, so if you have any other questions, you can feel free to email me um, or contact me on my office phone.